And ever since we have lost the glorious empire, there has always been a yearning to return to some sense of greatness. Um, and it has seen us as a nation behave in very strange ways. So it's the UK, it's Britain, but perhaps it's also for other places. Now, some of you would have read Paul Gilroy, and he called it, um, he refers to it as post-colonial melancholia. A kind of yearning for empire, for greatness, is related to what's happening here. So, and you can see it all around. So, for instance, you have a burger that's called Old Colonial. Have you had an Old Colonial? There's a burger called that in this country. There's a London bar called The Plantation. There's an Oxford cocktail called Colonial Comeback. And the polls would show uh, that many think the British Empire has been a proud thing. So some of the recent writers are actually writing about that. I mean, one of them would be Neil Ferguson, who argues, for instance, that the British Empire enhanced global welfare and the virtues of trade and give us the rule of law. That may be the case. But we need the rule of law to operate now. Now, you have seen the debate, and I mean, I can go on and quote and so on. There are many things that are happening here. Now, while being unfairly represented as a demon that has the UK in its grips, the EU, though, is no paragon of virtue. Now, people may disagree with me here. Uh, so the, the whole growing of and the rising of the far right is just one of the troubling developments um, for, for, for a bloc whose member states until recently used to war against each other. You know? So I think that the EU, EU has not been helpful at, um, at times in the Brexit debate. And I, I can say this from two pers perspectives. I think the focus has been on the act of separation and deterring others from following the UK's queue. So what has been missed are the strategic implications of alienating the UK, not that the UK has, hasn't contributed towards alienating itself, and the hesitancy in dealing with heavy bureaucracy and the reality of not so transparent governance taking over the role of nation states. Now, Wayne, uh, this may not be something that Wayne would subscribe to, so this is why I'm using I here. So I think what's at play here in this whole discourse is how Groups of people or groups of people in power can manipulate power to the extent that they are, they are willing to sacrifice the ideal of a European project in order to maintain what is in their particular interest or to stay in power. So I, I hope that we can have that on the table and have a conversation around that. Before I hand over to Wayne, I think that one of the things that strike me and us in this conversation is the hesitancy to see what is happening here in terms of the rights of future generation. And I want to quote here a book that um, Leonora has read and I've also read it this, from the, Span the Spanish philosopher Daniel Inerarity, The Future and Its Enemies, where he contends <coughs> that the democratic political systems are too fixated on the presence Hence, a focus on the public and the voters' interests with a disregard for the future consequences. <coughs> so the focus is on the immediacy, the omnipresence of the short term. And you could see it in the discourse we're having over Brexit. So the voters dismiss the future as it is the future and because it belongs to someone else. And when I, I look at my sons and look at young people and others around me and so on, I think the young people will never forgive us. You know, all, all, all of us, these mature adults who have landed them in this Brexit nonsense. So I think that we need to, in our reflection, we need to think about what's the role of the, the, the rights of future generation who are not there, but they also have a stake in the conversation around Brexit borders and belonging. So I would say that our intention is that it ought to be a conversation. So this is no, nothing rigid here. It's not fixed, it's a conversation. And we want to locate Brexit as part of a, a larger trend of fear, of suspicion, of insularity, of intolerance, 
and how this runs as a people of faith, the community of faith here, counter to the way of the Jesus people, so to speak. What are the implications for the church as a space for solidarity beyond borders? I mean, Wayne, this is not the first time that we have um, collaborated on a project of this nature. And just to say to colleagues here that this is one in a series of conferences we've been having at the end of the year. So we started this in 2016. 16. And then in 2017, and this is 2018. So 2016, our gathering was on multiple religious belonging. So we are doing conferences that our ecclesial tradition may not necessarily subscribe to, but they would allow us the freedom to do it. So we are doing it. So multiple religious belonging was the first one. And the second one was on talking back to the hagiography around the European, the, the Lutheran Reformation or the Protestant Reformation because we had minority voices. The only space where we had minority voices countering the hagiography that was happening in the country around the Reformation. And this one is, I mean, we planned this quite well in advance and then we thought, well, this would be a, an interesting point because it's a larger story, but it has taken its own turn. I mean, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of where you see what we should be um, uh, where we are going or what you expect of it? No, um, well, I, I would want to say that, I mean, Brexit, it seems to me, is is a UK expression of what is happening in other places in the wo around the world too, isn't it? I mean, um, Trump, um, what happens in, um, in, in, in Italy, um, are, are, are expressions of um, where we belong and where we don't belong. And it's just that Brexit... Is, uh, is the UK expression of that. So we don't feel that we are European enough to want to belong to this um, union, or we feel that we are, but it's an expression of um, national identities that are you know, becoming much more prevalent and much more into sharp focus. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so it's part of a kind of a bigger, bigger, bigger picture that's happening around the world. Yeah. You carry on? No, you no. Can. So what we think we would, well, so, I mean, the way in which we want to work, Michael has said that, you know, the emphasis is on a sense of conversation. Uh, and so it's very much that we want to um, have the space to hear and to engage together because we all, you know, we, we've expressed something of those different places where we feel that we belong and don't belong already. So we want to hear those um, perspectives and those insights um, reflecting back I mean we w uh, reflecting back on what we've been sharing of course it would be a brave person to to say actually in, in this context although I want to ref you know say that we ought to be able to say this actually I voted remain mm -hmm. or actually I voted leave it'd be a brave person to say I voted leave in this context um, so but we need to be able to say actually we need to hear those voices too mm -hmm. Um, because there is all that diversity and there's all those reasons for voting or not voting or participating uh, in those ways. So we do want it to be a sense of, of conversation. We're all here to bring something to uh, the conversation and we're all here to receive. And so in that, in that sense, it does need to be that um, kind of uh, open conversation and dialogue uh, together. In that vein, perhaps it would be good to just sit around our tables with the people around our table and just to engage uh, together uh, and then we'll bring the conversation back together what do you think around your tables are the, the, the issues around Brexit that are the most foremost in your mind and as we sit here as part of the church Michael mentioned you know we have a vision uh, of solidarity beyond our borders we've not always been terribly good at that in the church the fact that you know I'm Congregationalist, not United Reformed Church, or the fact that you're Presbyterian and not that, that, we're, that we're different. We're not. We're not um, experts at solidarity by any means, but our brokenness does mean to say that we have something to say about what it means to be um, divided, mm. um, and so we can maybe speak from that. So what you know. So two two questions, two uh, topics for our conversation around the table. What do you think are the most pressing things? But what can we as a divided church say how do we speak in uh, how do we speak into these polarized positions 
that would help to move the conversation forward just for the next 10 minutes or so uh, as, a, as a way into our conversations together. And, and, then, we'll, and then we'll, we'll collect we'll come back some, together. some ideas.